Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present my work and also welcome you all to my talk on the entropy in the early universe. In this talk today, I will, I will discuss some work done with my, in collaboration with my PhD supervisor, Juan Garcia Bellido, in which we study the effect of, of the increase of entropy that is of irreversible or non-andiabatic phenomena in gravity and cosmology and the potential phenomenological consequences that this may have. This is the outline of my talk today. I will start by giving you a brief motivation of why we are doing this. Then I will quickly review how cosmology usually works in a reversible fashion. Then I will introduce how, um, how thermodynamics or the second law of thermodynamics can be embedded in mechanics in order to understand how entropic forces work. I will then generalize this to our setup, which is general relativity. I will apply this framework to cosmology, to a, what we could call non-equilibrium cosmology, and I will finish with some conclusions. So let's start, as we all know, general re relativity is a time reversible theory. There is, no, uh, there is no preference in principle for a, for a given arrow of time. And well, quite of the, uh, most of the universe expansion is adiabatic. That is, we have solutions to the Freeman equations in which the universe expands, uh, but, but contractions of the universe could also be a solution because the, uh, the total entropy of a moving volume is conserved. And so there, there is reversibility in most of the history of the universe. But there are quite a few non-equilibrium epochs in which there is no time reversibility at all. It couldn't happen that the then a contraction would lead to some, somehow a decrease of entropy that couldn't happen. So we argue that irreversible phenomena are somehow not included in general relativity in a complete and systematic way. And what we try in this work is to fill precisely this gap. As I, as I told you, I will start with a brief discussion about reversible cosmology. Let's start with cosmology 101. And this is postulating the following metric of an homogeneous and isotropic universe. And this uh, quite highly symmetrical universe that satisfies the so-called Copernical principle has the, this well-known form by all of you. And, and of course, there's such a universe which is homogeneous and isotropic must be also filled with a homogeneous and isotropic fluid, which is what we call the perfect fluid. It's characterized by a pressure and a, well, by an energy, by a stress energy tensor that has in turn density and pressure. And these are also usually linked by an equation of state. When we put these two together, the ansatz for the metric and the stress energy tensor, we get the dynamics for the, for the scale factor of the universe, which are the so-called Freeman equations. Now, what can we say about this perfect fluid that fills the universe? Well, from the Bianchi identities, we know that the, the stress and energy tensor is conserved in a covariant way. And, and this gives us the following continuity equation. But then we could also recover it from the second law of thermodynamics by setting that the temperature times the time evolution of the entropy is zero. We would get that this, this quantity is precisely equal to some change in the internal energy of the perfect fluid times some work due to the expansion of the fluid. Now this quantity when set to zero gives precisely the continuity equation, but it's only true in equilibrium. More generally, it will be greater or equal than zero. And so we could think what happens when that is the case. Should we then go beyond adiabatic cosmology? If we try to do that, the continuity equation becomes like this. It gets an additional term due to the non-vanishing time derivative of the entropy. And if we plug this in the, into the Freeman equations, that, we get, that is, we get the first Freeman equation and we grab it with respect to time. And we forget for a moment about the Einstein equations. Then we get this non-equilibrium second Friedman equation in which the dynamics of the scale factor of the universe takes into account that the entropy is increasing and has what we could call an entropic force that is 
further driving the expansion. Now, can we make this statement about the inclusion of non-equilibrium dynamics actually more rigorous? And the answer is yes. And in order to do that and include it in a completely consistent way, we will use the, the variational formulation of non-equilibrium thermodynamics. This is a, an existing work developed a few years ago. And it's nothing but, but, the, but the merging of two, of two physical principles. First is the stationary action principle, which of course is what we use when we, when we have an action and we want to derive the equation of, of motion that gives us the dynamic of a physical system. And the laws of thermodynamics, which are sort of phenomenological, right? But, but still we want, we want to impose them. And what we do is to try to solve this stationary action principle that defines the physical variational problem with some constraints that are imposed by the laws of thermodynamics. That is, we, ba we basically impose that the entropy should increase with time evolution. And so we are not quite solving the, the original stationary action principle, but instead we are restricting the true solutions to those that also fulfill the, therm the thermodynamical constraint. Now, as an example, let us consider a simple mechanical system uh, which has an action defined as the integral of a Lagrangian. And this Lagrangian now is not only, uh, is, is not only a, a function of, the, of a variable Q and its time derivative Q dot, but it has an additional degree of freedom, which is the entropy. And when we actually take the variation of this action, what we find is an additional term, this partial derivative of the Lagrangian with the respect to the entropy times the variation of the entropy. And the trick now is to impose that this variation of the entropy should be equal to, to should be somehow related to variations of the, of the existing variables of the system. And when we do this, what we get is this constrained equation of motion, which looks very much like the Euler-Lagrange equation for a simple mechanical system but now includes an additional term because we added the thermodynamical constraint before. Of course, we don't know in principle what, it, what this F in the variational constraint is, but we can obtain it from a, an additional constraint, what is called a phenomenological constraint. And what this does, instead of relating variations of the entropy with variations of the, of the physical variable, which is a sort of a more abstract notion, it relates time derivatives. And using this, we can effectively know how the dynamics of the system is, is modified. And we also get one nice thing, which is that the symmetry and the time reversion is broken. So we are, we are effectively getting what we could call an, an arrow of time, a notion of, of future, which is, is kind of be reversed. Now, how to apply this to general relativity? Well, it is as simple as taking the Lagrangian formalism of general relativity and performing the same kind of, of constraints. That is, we, we try to find solutions to the variational problem in general relativity, but adding a constraint which is motivated by thermodynamics, by this, um, but, the, but this imposition that the entropy should increase with time evolution and not the opposite. Now, of course, if we perform the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action uh, of general relativity, we get again the similar terms, the first of which will be then related to the, to the Einstein tensor, the second to the stress energy tensor. And there appears this, this additional one, which comes from the additional dependence of the Lagrangian of the, of, on the entropy of an additional degree of freedom in a way. Then again, if we add the constraint that this variation of the entropy should be related to somehow variation of the metric, which is our physical variable in the, when considering general relativity. If we do this, we try to solve the variational problem and we add this thermodynamical constraint, we get what we could call the non-equilibrium Einstein field equation, which is nothing but again, the Einstein tensor equal to the, to the stress energy tensor minus this additional term, which we call a friction or, or an entropic force that is also affecting the gravitational dynamics. 
Now, what, would, what do we know again about this friction tensor? In principle, again, not too much. We know that because the Bianchi identities are satisfied and the covariant derivative of the, of the Einstein tensor is zero. Then we also have the, the covariant derivative of the stress energy tensors should be equal to the covariant derivative of this friction tensor. So, so there is a covariant non-conservation of, the, of these two tensors that is somehow always balanced, but we don't, we don't know much more. And in order to impose a phenomenological constraint as we did before, we, did, we need a proper notion of, of time evolution. And so how can we give this proper notion of time evolution in general relativity? This is done by working in the so-called ADM formalism. And this is nothing but the three plus one splitting of space-time into constant time hypersurfaces and correspondingly, uh, and a splitting of the, of the full metric G into H, which is, a, which is an induced metric on these hypersurfaces and a tensor product of the normal vector to these hypersurfaces, which is called N. Equivalently, we can express the line element in terms of, of these functions N, which is the, the lapse function, and the NI functions, which are the shift vectors, which is the shift vector, and then the then again the induced metric H on the on the constant time hypersurface. In this uh, ADM formalism, what we get is that the Einstein field equation is equivalent to Hamilton evolution equations, and so we replace the Lagrangian formulation of general relativity by a Hamiltonian one. And in this Hamiltonian uh, uh, formulation of general relativity. We introduced, of course, a, a canonical conjugate momentum, which is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect with to the time derivative of the spatial metric H. And we also introduced, of course, a Hamiltonian density. Then again, in order to obtain the evolution equations, which we, must, we must take into account the thermodynamical constraint. And what we see is that the first Hamilton equation, this derivative of or variation of H, of H with respect to canonical momentum stays the same. But on the contrary, the, the second Hamilton equation, which is the one that carries actually the dynamics of the, of the system, this one gets an, uh, an additional term of entropic origin, this, this entropic term in the, in the Hamilton equation, which now depends on, on a friction tensor, what they call F tilde, which is nothing but the spatial projection of the original friction tensor that we were considering before. And this is because only the spatial metric is a physical degree of freedom. The constraints are also the same as we would have in usual general relativity and are given by the variations with respect to the laps and the shift vector. Now, what is this F tilde, this spatial part of the friction tensor? We can impose it again by giving some phenomenological constraints which relate variations of the entropy or time derivatives of the entropy with time derivatives of the physical variable. In our case, instead of picking time derivatives, we pick what is the evolution along, the, along this collection of constant time hypersurfaces. And this is given by the leave derivative with respect to the, with respect to the normal vector to these hypersurfaces. This constraint, what it's say, saying is that there should be internal entropy production, positive internal entropy production. But we need another one and it's the so-called entropy balance equation, which means nothing but the, the lead derivative of the total entropy production should be related with the lead derivative of the internal entropy production, as well as the fluxes, the, the fluxes of entropy that there may be, and which are not actually imposing anything else on the dynamics. Now, once that we have understood that by the the fact that we have irreversible phenomena, we have an increasing entropy in any system, we get the modifications of the dynamics. It's time to see how we define temperature and entropy for the matter content. This is very clear in the case of a mechanical system, because then the Lagrangian is usually written as a kinetical energy minus an internal energy, which has a dependency on the entropy. Then the temperature is nothing but the derivative of the internal entropy with respect to the entropy internal energy with respect to the entropy, sorry. In the case of fluid, you have hydrodynamical matter. Then the Lagrangian density is usually given by, the, by this quantity here. 
and we can we can define the temperature in an analogous but continuous way. But we can also assign temperature to an entropy to the gravity to the gravity sector, and this, this is not a surprise in, in light of the of black hole thermodynamics. And for instance, if we consider the the Gibbons Hawking York term in, in general relativity, and we compute it for a horizon. We find, for instance, that for a Schwarzschild black hole, this Gibbons Hawking York term is precisely equal to minus the time integral of the temperature of the black hole, the Hawking temperature of the black hole times the entropy of the black hole. And this gives a this gives a, a nice concept of internal energy of the, of the gravitational sector. And it also signals an underlying quantum discretion because separately temperature and entropy of a black hole are, are quantum, but the product is classical as it doesn't depend on H. Now, coming back to the beginning, we can apply this formalism to cosmology and we can compute the Hamilton constraint and the Hamilton evolution equation for a homogeneous and isotropic universe that is filled with a homogeneous and isotropic fluid. And using this rigorous formulation of non-equilibrium phenomena in general relativity, we get precisely the same Hamilton equation, the same second Freeman equation that we heuristically derived in the beginning of the talk, which has this additional term. So now we find that this depends on the trace of this friction tensor. And actually from the phenomenological constraint, one can see that this trace of the friction tensor is related to the temperature and the production of entropy. And the non-equilibrium second Freeman equation is precisely the same as we, as we saw before. This term of entropic origin can be very relevant in some parts of the evolution history of the universe when this is non-adiabatic. We can think of entropy production during preheating, during phase transitions, during black hole formation. And then if this, if you, if you see the, the sign of the term may momentarily lead to a cosmic acceleration, which is a, which is a nice result and may have potentially important consequences. Well, to sum up, I will, I, I will give you my conclusions. First, the laws of thermodynamics modify the dynamics of any physical system and break time reversibility. And this can be done in a, in a rigorous way. We saw that the Lagrangian Hamiltonian formulations of general relativity can be modified and, uh, and can be very well fit into this general framework and include the second law of thermodynamics. Particular for cosmology, this means the appearance of an additional term of entropic origin in the Freeman equation. And we argue in light of all, of all this work that the effect of non-adiabatic phenomena in the, in the expansion history of the universe should be revisited and more carefully studied in light of our results. And this is all I wanted to, to explain today. Thank you very much for your attention.